So thank you, Vishal. Um, so I'm going to first pick up with one note from last time and then directly pick up on this integral transform theme and use a Riemann Hilbert problem in that context um, before I actually continue on. So I always want to kind of pause for another example. But so where I ended last time is I was giving these classes of functions for which we have this so-called Plumelge formula. And I'll remind you what that is. So we had class one, which was holder, continuous functions, and I really specified it on a smooth bounded, smooth bounded uh, curve. Okay, and then what I wrote, okay, we had this identity. And this is true for all S in gamma. And so implicit in this statement, I'm saying first we have, we take the Cauchy integral, we evaluate it off, and then we have boundary values as we return to the contour from two different sides, and we recover the integrand effectively that way. Um, and the, the rationale behind why you have these boundary values was I wrote this. S minus S prime. And this was bounded by the holder, alpha holder seminorm and S minus S prime. And last time I, I wrote one minus alpha, it's actually alpha minus one. So this is kind of a typo I had on the board at the end of the last lecture. Right? And because this is now integrable for alpha positive, you can make sense of these limits. And that's morally why the holder condition comes into the Cauchy integral. Okay, so that's basically where we were last time. And then now I want to take a little bit of a tangent. It's not much of a tangent, but I want to talk about the Fourier conversion formula. Okay. And I want to derive the integral transform using a Riemann-Hilbert problem. And this is actually the idea that I will get to at the end of all my lectures with the inverse scattering transform, where you start with a differential equation. And it's a non-trivial idea that out of a differential equation, you arrive at a boundary value problem in the complex plane. And out of that boundary value problem, you end up with the integral transform. And this will show you in a kind of a simplified setting exactly how that happens. So I'm going to consider a differential equation for a function mu. And let's call this guy star. All right, so it's a first order equation. So z will be a complex parameter. Well, initially it's going to be real. And then we'll talk about it later as a complex parameter. This I like writing Q naught because once I go down the road later, this will be an initial condition for some uh, PD. Yes, yeah, so Q naught is a function of X, and let's just assume it's smooth, decaying to however many orders we want. As I progress and I talk about what are called Hardy spaces, you can come back to this and relax the conditions if you like. So we can talk about that, for example, in the discussion section. Okay, so the, st the first step is, and I mean, this, this was an observation, I should say, I believe you can find it in uh, Abelowitz and Focas in the complex variables book, where they actually, they do this calculation. Um, so step one is, we want to set up the Riemann-Hilbert problem. And so I'm going to do this by constructing two solutions of this. And of course, the first order equation, so those two solutions are related. But more than that, so these, each solution will have um, some very specific analyticity properties. 
So I'm going to find two solutions, which I'll call mu plus and mu minus, and you'll see why plus and minus. These guys are functions of x depending parametrically on z. And I want them to satisfy some properties. So first, of course, mu plus minus should solve star. The second one is the limit as x goes to, it actually switches, so minus plus infinity mu plus minus of x parametrically on z, this will be zero. So we have our two solutions. One's normalized at minus infinity, one's normalized at plus infinity. Okay. And I just really want these two conditions. Okay, so I have my two initial value problems to solve, or, or boundary value problems if you'd like. Okay, and so let me cut to the chase. And okay, so if you're gonna solve this, you use an integrating factor, and then to get the solution, assuming enough decay on this, to get the solution that's normalized at minus infinity, you then integrate after doing the after rewriting this using the integrating factor, you integrate from minus infinity. And what you find then is My minus signs all correct. Z X minus S Q zero of S. Yes. That's the solution you find. Okay. And then you look for the other one, mu minus. And it's really the same form. You just have to account for now the fact that we'll integrate from here to here minus sign accounting for the x being in the lower bound, but then we have the same. The same integral. Okay. So now I claim that these two functions, so now we think, okay, we solve this, we have solution for all x, now let's fix x and think about what happens in z. And so let me first do an integration by parts on mu plus. So thinking fixed x, I want to say what would happen for large z. So if you think back to what I did for the error function, I had a couple things I need to do. I needed to construct the jump condition, and I also needed to understand the large z behavior. And so let's do integration by parts, just like we did in the error function, to understand large z. Okay, so you go through this calculation, and so I integrate this term, I differentiate this, so when I integrate this in S, I get a minus, so I get an I over Z, and then this thing evaluated at the bound, so I get zero from this bound, from this bound, the exponential cancels when I plug in for S, and so then I get Q zero of X. And then, right, then we have minus from integration by parts, i over z, integral minus infinity to x, x minus s, and then I move a derivative onto q. And something I'll skip over for now, but let's note here, that this tends to zero. As z goes to infinity, right? And so throughout all of this, you know, you can think about, you know, I'm kind of playing fast and loose with what, where z is restricted to. So everything I said here first works for z real. Of course, z away from zero. But, Let's think about what this expression looks 
right? So x minus s, x is the upper bound, so this thing is positive. x minus s is positive. So then as z starts on the real axis, goes into the upper half plane, this, the imaginary part, is going to add some exponential decay. So this, you can show, is an analytic function in the upper half plane. And this, then, you can say is true in the upper half plane. Okay, Because even if you go to zero along the real axis, you basically use the riemann lebesgue lemma to say that that term goes to zero. And then, if, of course, if you go off in the upper half plane, you're adding some exponential decay, so it's even going to zero faster. Okay, and so a similar formula you can see will hold for mu minus, and we won't really need it, but the, let's summarize this as analytic in C plus and order one over Z. And this is analytic just say, okay, same integrand, but now s is always larger than x, so it's going to have the opposite. It's analytic in the lower half plane, and also order 1 over z. Okay, so I'm just about there. So I have analytic function above that decays at infinity, analytic function below that decays at infinity. Let's compute the jump condition. So I like to just kind of take one extra step, and let's make a definition to find mu. Yes, I'll abuse some notation here, just so we understand that it's just a function of z, and we're fixing x. So plus of x, z, for the imaginary part of z, positive mu minus of x, z, for the imaginary part of z negative. Okay, and now let's collect the properties of mu. Right, and I'm trying to remember the exact order I put them in before. So mu is analytic in c take away r. Okay, uh, mu is continuous up to r from above and below. Well, okay, that statement depends on some assumptions on q, but let's, you know, if we have a nice, say, Schwartz class like Dave was working with, everything's great. Three, mu is uniformly order one over z as z goes to infinity. And then four, and so now there's actually no confusion in me using my plus and minus. Right, and this will be for s in the real axis where I have my jump. And let's think about this. So I'm gonna take mu plus, minus mu minus, so I'm going to take this integral plus this integral, so I end up with the integral of all of r. And let get my exponents the right sign, i, z, x, integral minus infinity, infinity, u0 of s, yes. Right, so my jump condition is actually e to the i, z, x, times the Fourier transform of Q0. Right, so somehow, magically through setting up a Riemann-Hilbert problem following the ODE, we already see a forward transform of the data on the right-hand side. Sorry, what does the second condition um, mean? Uh, mu is continuous? This second, one? Yeah. That, so this, I have a, a function that's defined everywhere except for the real axis. And so the function on the right-hand side extends continuously up to the, up, sorry, down to the real axis. And the function on the, 
the bottom just contends continuously. So it takes continuous boundary values. Yeah, right, where it's discontinuous, but yeah, you can. All right, so then based on this discussion, I know how to solve for mu. So mu is just the Cauchy integral of this, and actually I should be a little bit, um, let me just rewrite this because my notation is, so I have s here, I need to integrate with respect to s prime these, so it's kind of a little awkward, but once I get here it's less awkward. that let's because I have X it'll be clear if I write it this way because I have multiple X's and S's all floating around and I like to use Z as a complex variable that lives in an open set and S as a variable that always lives on a contour I try to keep that distinction and here it kind of makes things a little bit a uh, little bit cumbersome. Okay, but really this is, this is the relationship that matters. Okay, so step two, step one is the longest. Step two is solve. Solve the Riemann-Hilbert problem. Not that, even the first two lines, Yeah. the first two lines, mm -hmm. how did you write this? Sorry, this is maybe a naive question, but how did you write this? Uh, so those are these two solutions that satisfy these boundary conditions. But, but this was a guess. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, right, but yeah, so you solve by integrating factor. But the, the whole reason why I want to look for those guys is an absolute guess. Right, so it's, it's not... There's no reason you look at this and say, oh, to get an integral transform out of this, I'm going, I know I need these guys. That's, that's a leap to understand that these are the two I want to look for. Okay. And so now we solve the Riemann-Hilbert problem. Well, you might say, why solve sorry, it? Sorry, we sorry. already have... Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the, from the first equation, if I formally integrate, mm -hmm. then I can write something like this, and then you just divide it into minus infinity to x and x to infinity and call it mu plus and mu minus. Right. That's, uh, and then you see that it happens to satisfy those two conditions yes. and then you proceed. Is that the that's chain that's of, that's uh, that's okay. Way to go. okay, 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 okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. All right, so, right, so we, you, now I'm going to solve this Riemann-Hilbert problem. So here is my statement of my Riemann-Hilbert problem. These, I need to find a function mu that satisfies all of these. And you might say, why do I need to find it? Because I have, I have mu. But now I'm going to solve it using the Cauchy integral, which gives me another representation. And that is what gives me the inversion formula. So I find two representations for the same thing. And that is the magic. Okay, so mu, the function of z, is then the Cauchy integral of this, so integral over all of r, um, e to the i s x q zero hat of s over s minus z d bar s. That's the solution. Step two is quick. It's the Cauchy integral of the data. And we'll see this in more generality later. That you know, this is because right now you should be a little bit concerned, not about this, not really about this, but about that. But this condition is actually entirely a local thing. So, but we'll deal with unbounded co contours in a minute. Okay. 
So now I have mu, and then step two was easy. Step three is well, what I call recovery. And what the recovery step is hidden in this relationship. So from mu, if I multiply by minus i, multiply by z, and take the limit as z goes to infinity, this term drops out, and I'm left with just q0 of x. So I want to re basically recover the residue at infinity of mu, and I have a new representation for mu, and that will give me a new representation for q0. So let's call this guy two stars. From two stars, I claim that the limit z goes to infinity. I've only did this for mu plus, and you could even take this limit only for mu plus if you like. Minus i z mu of z. Right? Take this, multiply by minus i, multiply by z, and I isolate this. Okay, so that is q0 of x. Now we have another formula for mu, so let's actually compute that limit using that other formula. Now we, we should know what we get, but let's just see exactly how that comes out. So now I'm not going to use this notation. I'll put in the 2 pi i. And so then, so I get a... Two, so there's a 2 pi i hidden in here. So my i cancels it, gives me an overall minus sign. And I still have a limit hiding here. Then r e to the i s x q0 hat of s. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this minus sign and the z that should be here to write this as 1 minus uh, s over z. So if you actually... Okay. And now, if you like to, to do this recovery, that compute this limit, I can actually do any direction I want. This is true. So let's just go directly up the imaginary axis. We avoid any technical difficulties. We don't go along the real axis. That's much harder. Just go directly straight along the imaginary axis in the upper half plane. And this converges to 1 for each fixed s. Use dominated convergence theorem, and you end up with... And that, by this formula, is q0 of x. All right, so from really this setup here, starting with the differential equation, defining two special solutions, matching the solutions, examining their analyticity properties, setting up a Riemann-Hilbert problem, it's a simple just additive Riemann-Hilbert problem, you can derive an integral transform. Okay? And maybe in the lectures, depending on time, but definitely, if, I, if not in the discussion section, we'll take this, we'll add a mu t equation, and then we'll derive an integral transform for the solution of a PD. And basically, this would be called what's called a lax pair once we add another equation, and we can derive a solution formula for a PDE using the exact same technique. And that is the philosophy that extends to the inverse scattering transform for nonlinear PDEs. We have these, these solutions here. Okay. So I'll get more into that later, but I wanted to show you how, in practice, you can set up a Riemann Hilbert problem and it can give you something new. Okay. And then 
let me make one more point just so there's no misunderstanding. So this is a Riemann-Hilbert problem. It's a very simple one. Right? So this is just what I would say is an additive jump. But I could equally as well look for something like this. And this is not the most general setting either. Look for a jump condition of that form. And those, those arise in practice as well. Right? So it's not, I still have a right-hand side, but now I have a coefficient here. More than that, there's no reason, so these are all scalars. There's no reason mu needs to be a scalar. This could be a matrix, 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 and so on. And so we'll encounter that. But I still haven't gotten to a precise definition of what a Riemann-Hilbert problem is, at least and this is fairly precise, but I, I like a little bit, a little bit more detail. Sorry, if, if this is the jump condition, then step two will be generalized also? You can, for the scalar case, you can generalize step two. Step two, okay, okay. Yeah. But in the matrix, once you have uh, G being a matrix and maybe mu is a vector, you can't write down a formula anymore. Okay, okay. But, and, and, and it shouldn't be obvious how you generalize step two, given that one either. Given that, okay. And one more thing is that you are given Q naught of S, right? Uh, so typically after this, the next step is to actually finally solve the integral, and that is the solution, right? I mean, so after this, now it just depends on the details of the problem. Where you, you give a Q naught and I have to do this integral further, right? Uh, like step two is the solution, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But then you have to explicitly solve it, right? I mean, so that... Uh, Are you asking how you actually compute this? Yes, yes. Yeah. So in this case, you actually don't need to because you're, you're after this large Z, and so you, you formally derive a pair. But in general, for the error function, we specifically need to evaluate. And so hopefully, well, today I will at least get closer to telling you how to actually solve that. Okay, so let me keep going. Um, so, right, there's class one. Let me talk about a second class that really makes discussing details of contours uh, simpler. So what you'll see as we go forward is that we'll often have piecewise linear contours. So we'll have corners in the contour. And basically, there's some issues with this assumption. So if you try to think, compute, compute a Cauchy integral on a square. Right, so we have to do a little bit more. And it's more convenient, in my opinion, to talk about class two, which is square integral functions. And if you like differential equations, which I think we all do, uh, this would be kind of a classical solution. You're continuous up to it. Using this, you would end up with some sort of a weak solution where you only take the boundary values almost everywhere, something like that. Well, almost everything will pose it in this way, but then it turns out that it's continuous. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to, since I'm a little bit behind, I'm not going to fuss over the details too much. But we talked about rectifiability initially for our contours. And rectifiability tells you that the, the gamma, so I had this gamma that took an interval to C, was continuous. We said the curve, and right, so parameterizes gamma. And, OK, say it's rectifiable. Well, that tells you that this guy has a derivative almost everywhere. So then at, those, at such points, you have a tangent. But that doesn't actually tell you that you have a tangent to the curve at arc length almost everywhere on the curve. Right? So the, the perfect example of this is looking at the so-called devil's staircase with the Cantor set, where you have 
a derivative at arc, arc length one, measure one's uh, points on the curve, but then the total arc length of this curve of the devil's staircase is two. So you're missing tangents at half of the measure. And so really you end up want to say, wanting to say this is also absolutely continuous and it removes that technical bit. And that will all be captured in a nice condition uh, in a minute. Okay, so that's kind of some fussing with details. It's interesting just to, you know, when you try to generalize, because if I'm gonna take non-tangential va boundary values, I need a tangent, so I have a normal. And so this is the notation, L2 with respect to arc length, and you don't need the full generality of this, but some of the results, they're so powerful, they make, you just can proceed and never have to worry about things again. I mean, you'll see exactly. So here, a contour. So recall a contour is a finite union of arcs and curves. Curves are closed. And we'll also put in the restriction, and I didn't say this precisely yesterday, that any intersection of this finite union occurs at endpoints. So you, know, you, you don't intersect in the middle of a curve. If you do, you just break it up into, say, four curves. Is a finite union. curves and arcs. These guys can have infinite extent. And then we say a contour gamma satisfies a Carlison condition, Carlison condition with constant C of gamma, if, so C of gamma will be defined to be, so you take the supremum over all points in your curve, you take the supremum over all R positive, you then take a ball centered at the point on your curve of radius R, and you look at its arc length when it's intersected with the curve. So I have some curve, which might, Pick a point here with the ball, and I compute the arc length in there. Right, so this is my point S of radius R. And then this over R should be finite. So it's a condition on what happens at infinity and what happens locally all in one, because it's the supreme over all R positive. Right, so you can't have these space-filling curves. They certainly won't work. It won't satisfy the Carlison. All right. So the the best ref for this is. Uh, And Karlovich. Uh, 1997. So they have a book where all of the results I'll talk about state about Carlison curves are approved. Um, okay, so let me just first take a step by step. First, a piece that's needed for that is. These guys are well-defined bounded operators. All right, so now my contours are. Okay, and so this kind of giving you a little bit of a historical development. This is classical. This is really a Hilbert transform on R. And you can use Fourier for that. And if you want to see how this works, uh, Percy Daft has lectures at, from last summer at PCMI. It should be on the website. There's videos of the lectures on Riemann Hilbert problems and uh, notes will be published eventually. So. 
then this is true. So this is well-defined bounded linear operators on L2 of gamma. So first people knew this, then people knew this, when gamma is a Lipschitz graph. Okay, I'm not going to say exactly what a Lipschitz graph is because the next statement is going to include that case, right? But it's basically, uh, I won't write it down, but you, you know, it's, it's the graph of some function and that function is Lipschitz. <laughs> not, not too, not too enlightening. Okay. So actually, let me just then state that. D gamma plus minus are bounded linear operators on gamma, if and only if, right? So we assume gamma is a contour, and then they're bounded linear operators on gamma, if and only if gamma is a Carlson curve. Or I'll say gamma satisfies, I want to make sure my language is the same, satisfies a Carlson, Carlson condition. So it's the D condition for L2 boundedness of the Cauchy integral operators. So you can take, if you're working with a Carlson curve, which is, so if some of a curves or a contour satisfies this, I'll call it a Carlson contour. And so if you're working with that, you take the Cauchy integral of an L2 function off, and you have almost everywhere boundary values back on the curve. And that's a bounded linear operator. And let's see, there's, Um, an important fact that is also very useful in some other asymptotic calculations where contours have to shift as you do things, this does happen, the operator norm depends continuously on the Carlison constant. And so as, if things are changing in the complex plane and you're worried about something blowing up, you know as long as you can control this quantity, which is fairly easy to do, you know that the norms of your operators are all controlled. Okay. So, that is really, this theorem here kind of settles the whole theory for Cauchy integrals. And so the next piece is computing Cauchy integrals. You need this to really, to really handle that right-hand side, but now, okay, let's think about the error function example. How would we actually evaluate to compute the error function? Yeah. Uh, so, you, you mentioned that they're bounded linear operators, mm -hmm. right? So, if I understand this right, um, C gamma plus minus takes a function defined on the contour mm -hmm. to a complex analytic function off the contour. Is that the bound? Gamma would do that. C gamma will do that. Yeah, C gamma plus minus, so then you take the limit back. I see, okay, so uh, I see. So C gamma plus minus is I define a function on a contour define a complex analytic function off the contour Cauchy integral. by taking the Cauchy integral, and now I look at the limits back onto the contour. And when you say you're looking at, these are bounded linear operators in L2, you're looking at the map from a function on the contour to its limiting values back to the contour. So on the contour, off the contour, back to the contour. And when I write this well-defined, that really is saying that the limits occur on limits exist almost there. Okay. And so let me now kind of shift gears to actually numerically evaluating these things. Um, we, we won't need the full generality of this, but 
fairly quickly we're going to see curves that have corners. And so actually saying, just being able to look at it and say, yes, that's a Carlson curve. We have, um, we have, you know, applying this, that theorem is just straightforward. So there's really two, well, there's not two, there's more than two, but I, I'll point out two philosophies for first doing quadrature, and then we'll examine how those philosophies would extend to computing into Cauchy integrals, specifically. So one, you could look at quadrature nodes and weights. So I want to find nodes, xi, and weights, wi, and you know I'll, I'll stay kind of in the classical setting for quadrature, and we'll first do integrals over minus one, such that. Right, so what do quadrature nodes and weights do? Well, you really say, I'm going to take a function that I want to integrate, and it is well approximated by right, So I take my function values, I include my weights, and then I have a delta. And in what sense is there an approximation? Well, the sense is in an integration sense. Right? And so then you have your quadrature formula, which your integral is approximately equal to some function values multiplied by the weights. And, you know, there's things like Gaussian quadrature that, you know, use zeros of orthogonal polynomials to do these things. Right, so that's one kind of philosophy, and the next one is, is not really unrelated, but I'll kind of present it as though it's distinct. Second one would be function approximation. So using a basis, bi, Approximate, right? So how? I don't know. Not that we'll discuss specific situations where we will know how. But somehow you find an approximation, ci phi i. Right? So okay, if you want to think of your functions as being delta functions with these weights, then right. But, Okay, and then this is in the sense that this is approximately equal, so now I sum over i, I have my coefficients, and I have to integrate my basis. Right? Okay. So that's two possible ways to compute it for computing integrals. And Right, so once you know the nodes and the weights, this is easy. Once you have your basis, this could be harder because now I need to find out a way to compute this integral in closed form. If I don't have it in closed form, this is useless. So we'll see the same complication now when we try to extend this philosophy to Cauchy integrals. So now for Cauchy integrals, and let's just so if I take the Cauchy, so I'm going to use a notation that i is the interval minus one one with usual in, usual orientation. So then I can just say this. Right, and so then this is in setting one, where we're using quadrature nodes and weights. Once I know the quadrature nodes and weights, this is dead easy. Right, this is just 
the sum of my f of xi weights i at xi minus c. Right? Just because my deltas, these deltas fire at each xi, and they actually put a pole in from the Cauchy kernel at each xi. Right? So, okay, given my quadrature nodes and weights, I have that. Great. We can compute the Cauchy integral. I don't like this. There are ways to handle this, but I want to compute boundary values of this. I've just introduced a bunch of poles on the contour. How am I going to compute boundary values? I could, there are ways to do this. There's very intelligent ways called quadrature by expansion by Leslie Greengard and his crew, where you kind of go locally, you do an expansion, and then you try to extend that to the boundary. And, but they usually work with less singular kernels. So this is, is kind of a dubious task. This one, but applying philosophy to, well, Now I have to compute over the interval my basis. Right? So this is only better if I can some, for some reason compute this. And you really need it in closed form. Right? So we want to expand our function in a basis for which we can apply the Cauchy integral to that basis in an explicit way. So let me actually kind of switch the order in my notes and just so I can hopefully get to something in, that involves the error function. Okay, so, right, so in my notes I have a way to talk about the unit interval. But I'm going to skip over that, and I'm going to go from the unit interval to the unit circle and talk about that first. So U, so this is Z equals 1 with that orientation. And let's put down a basis. Basis of Laurent monomials. Okay. And these guys. All right. So this didn't need to be the unit interval could be the unit circle. So to be able to compute the Cauchy integral of a function, assuming I can expand it in the basis, I need to be able to compute the Cauchy integral of the basis. Well, this is easy. Uh, let me, let's, actually, let me do J, because I don't want to get, yeah, I don't want to get any I's confused. And, okay, the way, one way to write this formula, it's maybe not the best way, but. If, so this is really just a residue calculation. If J is zero, mod z is less than one, and zero otherwise. Okay. Long story short, what this is saying is you do the Cauchy integral of one of these monomials, you have to, if you evaluate inside, you have to get something analytic. So if, you act, if your monomial gives you a pole, so if A is negative, you throw it away. If J is positive, you keep it. If you do the Cauchy integral and evaluate outside, if J is positive, 
that blows up at infinity, so you throw it away. If j is negative, that decays at infinity, you want to keep it, but you keep it with a minus sign. Because we always have the c plus minus c minus is your function, and that's where that minus sign is. Okay, so. Right, it's really just, yeah, computing Cauchy integrals of monomials, uh, Laurent monomials on the unit circle. So, the next question is then, how do we do this step? Right, so I've told you how to, given F expanded in a series of these guys on the unit circle, told you actually how to compute the, the Cauchy integral of the basis term by term, just taking either plus, plus one, minus one, or zero times each basis. That's all you do, each basis all. Okay, so to compute CJs, So we'll say, okay, one interpretation of the fast Fourier transform is as a method, a fast method, to interpolate a function on say minus pi pi with complex exponentials. That's one way to think about what the fast Fourier transform does, is it takes you from function values to an interpolant, the transform gives you the coefficients in the interpolant. Okay, so we have f, which takes the unit circle to c. Well, then let's define g of theta, which is f of e to the i theta. So now g, right, so if f is, say, a c infinity function on u, then g is a C infinity periodic function on minus pi pi. And so then I have, so I take a function on the unit circle, I really map it to a function on minus pi pi. I apply the FFT, which gives me an interpolant. And when the function's smooth, if you do your FFT right with the right parameters, this interpolant will converge very rapidly. In it, like unif really any norm you want, it will converge very rapidly. Okay, and then once I have that, the expansion, I map it back. Yes. So, so f is just a smooth function on the unit circle. So it, it is, well, so it maps to a periodic. Right? So it, you don't want to discontinue as you come back around on the unit circle. So in a sense, it is. Um, right, so you map to the unit circle, you interpolate, and then you map back. And if you follow that through, it gives you exactly out will come F as an approximation of this form. And maybe I'll say I goes from minus N to N, just to be a little bit more. And so you can compute those CIs with the fast Fourier transform. That's the point. Okay, so what I can do is I can take my function, map it to the minus pi pi, compute the coefficients, map back, and then apply the Cauchy integral operator exactly. And these clearly have nice boundary values. Right? This extended off a nice boundary values back to the unit circle. So defining C plus and C minus is no issue here. And so that's how you can compute the Cauchy integral operator of a smooth function on the unit circle. 
and in 24 seconds, I'm going to tell you how to do this for the real line. Or sketch it. So for, for R, let's see here, let's, let me define a transformation T, which will take me from the unit circle to R. It will be a Mobius transformation. So T, I plug in a point on the unit circle, and this... This will be a mapping that will take you from the unit circle onto the real line. Okay? So, if I have f defined on r, so f will now be a function r to c. I, to apply the fft, I need to do two transformations to bring it all the way back to minus pi pi. So the first, let's just define, let me just jump straight through it, and define it to... So this T takes me from the unit circle to R. So F composed with T is now a function on the unit circle. And then I do the same transformation and I get a function on minus pi pi. Now I have a function on minus pi pi. I do the FFT at certain function values to compute an interpolant and get my coefficients. And then I have to undo the transformation and go all the way back and get a function defined on R. And what does that function look like? And so f, uh, I'll use as a function, I'll use as a function s. And what you end up seeing is you actually get an expansion in the inverse of this mapping. And so this is something we can definitely talk more about in the discussion sections. So I am going through it a bit. And that's what uh, shouldn't be equal. There's an approximation. So that's what you end up with. So you take a function on R, map it to the unit circle, map it to minus pi pi, do interpolation, unwind everything back to R, and you get a rational expansion of F. And one last thing, let's assume this function decays at infinity. Okay, if this function decays at infinity, you can actually do the interpolation in such a way that one is an interpolation point for your FFT effectively, or um, I guess that's, um, right, uh, theta is zero, is an interpolation point. And then, okay, you're interpolating at infinity and in f decays. So this, the limit of this expression as s goes to infinity should be zero. So if f decays at infinity, We use, right, so you, okay, a good approximation, you can either use it as an interpolation point in which what I'm going to write down doesn't change the value of the interpolant at all, or it also doesn't really affect the quality of the approximation. I take the limit of this expression as s goes to infinity, and that should be zero. Well, this goes to one, so the sum of my cj's should be zero. Okay? What that means is I can write this as... Because right? the sum of the CJs is zero. So if I write it like that, now I've expanded, in a expanded it in a rational basis that decays at infinity. And so now this is an L2 function. And I can compute the Cauchy integral. Okay? And actually computing the Cauchy integral of this is just a residue calculation. You either get zero 
plus the basis, plus one times the basis function, or minus one times the basis function. You get nothing else. It's really the same in principle as this. So C plus, let me just write that out then. And my last, last statement. So C R plus of F of S is the sum over all. So now when J is zero, I actually get nothing. So I can, this is the sum over J positive. And CR, let's see, J positive, actually it should be J negative. Right, and why? Because this guy, when J is positive, this has a pole in the upper half plane. When I do C plus, I should get an analytic function in the upper half plane. So then C plus minus C minus is just F. And so this is exactly what you would use to solve the Riemann-Hilbert problem for the, error, for the error function. You take this Gaussian on the imaginary axis, you rotate it to the real axis. You do, map it all the way to minus pi pi, do an interpolant, map it back, and now you have this, and you can compute C plus and C minus. So I'll stop there. <laughs>